Greetings and salutations friends and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore where today we will be talking about the Grey Knights. Created from the God Emperor's own gene seed, they are the first, the last and the finest line of defense against the worst that chaos can offer. When not even an entire chapter of Space Marines is enough, Grey Knights get the job done. When the demon Primarch Angron invaded the world of Armageddon at the head of an army of demonic monsters and a personal bodyguard of 12 greater demons, it was 100 Grey Knight Terminators alongside the Space Wolves that slew the demon Primarch and sent his soul screaming right back into the wall. This is but one of their many tremendous achievements, so today we are going to have a deeper look at the Grey Knights, their history, their organizations, their weaponry, and of course some of their greatest successes. If you end up liking the video then please do consider leaving a like and a comment down in the comments section below for the greater glory of the algorithmic gods. Deities with even more power than the Chaos ones. Without further ado then, let us as always begin at the very beginning. The Grey Knights as an organization started out as a similar yet different group of individuals gathered by Malkador the Sigilite in the early days of the Horus Heresy. This group was known as the Knights Errant and the first nine founding members of the Grey Knights would be taken from amongst their ranks. But initially the Knights Errants showed absolutely no sign of the organization they would eventually become. The Knights Errants were a measure of immediate expediency, a stopgap measure and a little bit of an experiment as well. Malkador the Sigilite was not lacking in a grand ideas after all. His favoured brainchild, the Adeptus Administratum, is of course in the modern day Imperium the only thing that keeps the Imperium an Imperium, rather than a scattered semi-aligned group of independent planets or small federations. Another idea that had been bouncing about in that brilliant mind of his um, was the Inquisition, or what would eventually become the Inquisition anyways. Even if the Emperor had fulfilled his idealized plans for the galaxy, there would always be a need for someone to continuously enforce the Imperial truth as the Crusade had demonstrated that it was not at all easy to impose a unified narrative on the entirety of the galaxy. There would always be little spots of resistance here and there, little groups of naysayers, near-do-wells or rebellious inquisitive individuals who would delve far too deeply into secrets that were best left in the dark. But. Due to pressing circumstance, his plans were brought up rather rapidly, and the Knights Errants became his agents, a proto-version of the Inquisition, though focused primarily on military action due to, well, you know, the whole Horus heresy thing. Again, pressing circumstance. And so the Knights Errants would venture forth from Terra on missions deemed of vital importance to the Imperium by Markador the Sigilite. Not just the war effort either necessarily, mind you, though they were certainly heavily involved in that as well. Another of their key objectives at this early stage was the recruitment of further agents as well. Though the recruitment process did necessarily have to be a very careful and slow one since absolutely no one knew who they could actually truly trust during those tumultuous times. But we're not going to get too deeply into the Knights Errants here, that might be a subject for another video again. Suffice to say, the Knights Errants proved themselves more than worthy adepts. 
and they were recalled to Terra by Malkador shortly before the siege of the Imperial Palace and the full-scale invasion of the solar system by Horus's traitorous hordes. Eight of the Knights Errants would be selected to become the founding members of the Grey Knights. We know the names of some of them, though much is still shrouded in mystery. Though two of them are worthy of special mention, the first of course being Garviel Loken. He was intended to be the very first Supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights. An incredible honour, but one that he refused. He felt that his place was on the front line fighting against the Sons of Horus, and against the traitor Warmaster himself. Instead, the mantle of Supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights would be given to the second individual worthy of mention, Revuel Arvida, a sergeant of the Fourth Fellowship of the Thousand Sons Legion. An unlikely candidate to be the first Grand Master of the Emperor's most loyal sons, but at the same time there could be none more qualified to lead a chapter of psychers into battle. And not just because Revuel Arvida himself was a talented member of the Corvidia. The cult within the Thousand Sons specialised in precognitive abilities, but because of what Revuel Arvida had become. Now, upon accepting their place within the Grey Knights as the founding members, all of the individuals surrendered their original names and were given new ones, like Satre or Koyos. Gavia Loken was intended to bear the name Krios, and Revuel Arvida became Ianus, or Janus, as he was later referred to, though for him it was not simply a name change. Oh, no, it was a lot more than that, as the Astartes, known as Revuel Arvida, was bonded with a fragment of Magnus, caught in the Imperial Palace near the gateway that the Emperor had been experimenting on. The gateway that Magnus, in his hubris, had broken through in his attempt to communicate with the Emperor on Terra to tell him of Horus's betrayal. This was um, a failed experiment, in reality. Markador the Sigilite had originally intended to bind the fragment of Magnus within Revuel and allow it to possess him becoming essentially a lesser version of the full Primarch Magnus the Red. The Sigilite's plan was to then bind this copy, this doppelganger, to the Gateway, and therefore free the Emperor to continue to lead the Imperium. But the experiment, of course, failed and it looked for a time like both Revuel, Arvidia, and the Fragment might both be destroyed in the attempt. Malkador wanted to kill Arvidia once it became clear that the power of Magnus the Red could not be contained, even within the body of a superhuman Thousand Sons legionary. But the Khan stopped him choosing instead to try and free Revuel, who had been serving alongside the White Scars now and had become a very valued member of that legion, and he did this by smashing apart all of the machinery. Yes, this is how you turn off a sensitive, highly volatile machine, by smashing the control panels. I don't understand why the people at Chernobyl didn't think of this solution. But luckily, book logic dictate that by destroying all of this, it did not cause a cataclysmic release of psychic energies. Instead, it calmly and safely powered down whatever nonsense was going on, and so emerged Ianus or at least so the thing named itself, as it was no longer Revuel Arvidia, 
And it was also certainly not Magnus the Red, but rather an amalgamation of the two. And as just a slight sidetrack here, I gotta say the whole fragment of Magnus thing is one of the better ideas GW has had in the last uh, decade or so. Because it does make a great deal of sense for why Magnus can be both a traitor, Primarch, waging his war against the Imperium and being a complete asshole out there, whilst also being the same Primarch in the Horus Heresy, the guy that wanted to surrender to the Space Wolves because he realised what he had done was wrong, because he realised that he had been used, abused and tricked by the Chaos Gods. And it also opens up a whole host of very interesting possibilities, including a potential redemption, and normally you should be very careful and hesitant to begin any kind of a redemption arc because it is a massively overused trope, particularly by a certain sexual harassment company over in California that also ripped off some Games Workshop entities, where nobody's ever truly evil, just misunderstood. Certain characters like Angron, <laughs> or Abaddon, can never be redeemed, should never be redeemed. But if you set up the redemption arc from the very get-go, like they kinda did with Magnus and they did do with Fulgrim, until they retconned that whole goddamn painting thing, oh. <clears throat> calm down, Arch. In those cases, they can actually be pretty damn interesting character arcs. Whether or not Games Workshop is competent enough to write one of those... <laughs> Doubts. Anywho, the Eighth were then taken to see the Emperor personally, who approved of Malkador's selection, and gave them what would by later generations be referred to as the Emperor's Gift. He had crafted for the Grey Knights their very own Gene Seed, which rumour has it come at least in part from the Emperor himself. And many speculate that this is the reason why the Grey Knights have proven so absolutely resistant to the powers of chaos, to the point of practical immunity. With some of the Grey Knights, including a certain Drago character, <laughs> having been able to remain within the warp itself for extended periods of time without becoming corrupted. But of course, Gene Seed alone will not an army make, nor will eight Space Marines. No matter how psychically gifted they were, they were going to need a hell of a lot more than that. And so after their audience with the Emperor, Malkador transported the Grey Knights to Titan, Saturn's moon, where he had created a fully functional, furbished and staffed fortress monastery, along with a vast stockpile of gene seed and 100,000 recruits, each and every single one of which was a latent psyker of only the finest stock. This too incidentally is an indication that the Grey Knights, or at the very least something akin to them, had been on Malkador's mind for a very long time. Because finding a hundred thousand latent psychers, which might also be compatible with Astarte's gene seed and of the right age group, <laughs> that is no small task. But there was a further complication as well, and that complication's name, of course, was Horus Lupercal, and his invading traitorous hordes even now making their way towards the solar system. Malkador had already built the facility in the absolute most stringent secrecy imaginable and he had hidden it from observation with advanced near-magical technologies. But against the Warmaster, something extra was necessary. 
the entirety of Titan was shifted sideways out of reality and into the warp whilst protected by near unimaginably powerful Geller fields. This would hide the entire planet not just from direct scrutiny but from literal reality for a set period of years. This way, no matter what happened on Terra, the Grey Knights could not and would not be discovered by anyone. The secret of their existence was passed on to only a tiny handful of individuals, four human lords which would become the foundations of the Inquisition, and the Grey Knights would in turn become their chamber militants. The plan worked. The Horus Heresy was ended on Terra, although it also saw the God Emperor permanently entombed on the Golden Throne. Some years later, during the Second Founding, Titan re-emerged, and the Inquisitors immediately set out to have a meeting with Janus. Together they discussed many things, about the current state of the Imperium, its futures, the Inquisition and the Grey Knight's role within that future, and how they may aid one another, and eventually worked out the terms for their first agreement. Part of this was that the Grey Knights would remain a hyper-secretive organisation. They were entered into the official annals of the Imperium as the 666th chapter of the Adeptus Astartes. Uh, and considering nowhere near that number of successor chapters were created in the second founding, <laughs> I gotta say, stealth level novice, but uh, again, details. And beyond this official listing, which was swiftly buried and forgotten about, the only ones who knew of the existence of the Grey Knights would be the High Lords of the Inquisition, who would rely upon the Grey Knights to do the things that not even the Adeptus Astartes could be trusted to do. But by and large, the Grey Knights are left to their own devices, allowed to pursue their own agendas and to find their own objectives throughout the galaxy. They are as unwavering servants of the Imperium as any Inquisitor, and are more than trusted to do what is necessary without the constant involvement of the High Lords of the Inquisition. Although this uh, hands-off approach almost met with a bit of disaster during the War of the Great Long Yawn, or the War of the Beast as some people who haven't read those abominations call it, during which Kirill Sinderman, the last living Inquisitor some 1,500 years old at that point, which is the second most impressive thing about him, the most impressive being that he had somehow become a psyker in the, <laughs> in the interim, <laughs> almost died without passing on the knowledge and the clearance credentials to get to Titan. But luckily, with his literal last breath, he was able to impart the knowledge of the Grey Knights and how to get to Titan and how to get through the security grid without being turned into space dust to a fellow Inquisitor. Had that not happened, well, the Inquisition may very well have lost all contact with the Grey Knights. Instead, the Inquisitor, a lady by the name of Vianand, managed to get to Titan and inform the Grey Knights that they should stay out of the war against the repeating plot point, and she also informed them that the Inquisition would be splitting into the Ordo Xenos and the Ordo Hereticus where the Grey Knights would remain the chamber militant of the Ordo Hereticus, whilst the Ordo Xenos would adopt the Death Watch as their Ordo Militant. 
Incidentally, this was during the actions of best boy and absolute Chad superstar Draken Vankerich, master of assassins and beheader of all of the High Lords, who had been left in charge back on Terra, but during the closing year of the War of Turgid Syrup, he, due to pressing plot reasons, namely to prevent everyone who was reading the god-awful books from committing seppuku by snooze button, went insane and had to get the Imperial Fist to come back to Terra and execute him for his sins of being the only interesting character in a book series that can best be described as an act of war against the readership. Anyway, side tangent aside, that finishes up most of the history of the Great Knight. So, let us move on to some organization, shall we? Good old fashioned logistics. That's what you come to my channel for, after all, the nitty gritty details. After emerging back from the warp after the Horus Heresy, the Grey Knights had reduced 100,000 recruits to about a thousand odd battle brothers. A hefty rate of attrition, though there might still have been further recruits still in training granted. Though being a part of the second founding, technically at least, the Grey Knights did not submit to the teachings of the Codex Astartes, though they do tend to hang out around about a thousand battle brothers, give or take a couple hundred or so. But instead of being divided into the usual companies, they are instead divided into eight brotherhoods, which are of course the brotherhoods of the eight original masters of the Grey Knights, each of which is tasked with a different aspect of the Grey Knights operation. For example, the first brotherhood is the steward of the armory. As the name implies, he's the guy in charge of organizing the Tech Marines and making sure that all of the Grey Knight's vehicles are fully functional or getting repaired whenever required. The second brotherhood is responsible for the Grey Knight's warships, the third for the Librarius, the fourth for taking auguries and determining where their intervention is required, the fifth are the garrison forces, the protectors of the sanctum. The sixth are the high seneschals, the people taking care of the fortress itself and its day-to-day -day runnings. The seventh are the representative to the Inquisition, the official diplomats to the rest of the Imperium, and the eighth is the master of recruits, who takes care of all of the chapter's recruiting needs and the continuous replacements of fallen battle brothers. Additionally, each and every one of these brotherhoods are also fully equipped with warriors as well, able to both be deployed as full brotherhoods or even as individual independent squads if necessary. After all, even with a little bit above the usual number of space marines, 1,200 odd battle brothers are going to have a hard time covering an entire galaxy. A lot of tough calls have to be taken as to where the Grey Knights are going to commit their extremely limited resources. These decisions are made by the Chapter Council, which is made up of the eight leaders of each of the Brotherhoods and the Knights who does not have a brotherhood of his own, but instead holds the position intended for Garviel Loken, that of Supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights. In these conclaves, each and every one of the Grand Masters have an equal vote, though in cases of an impasse, it is the Supreme Grand Master who is the ultimate decider. He does not hold a direct role within the Grey Knights like the other Grand Masters, instead he is considered the premier battlefield commander, and will usually at any given time take charge of the most pressing combat assignment. 
It is very rare, however, for all of the Grand Masters to be gathered on Titan at any one time, so in reality the Chapter Council is more often made up of a handful of the Grand Masters, with some decisions also undoubtedly being made via astrotelepathic communication as well. In reality, of course, a conclave of the Chapter Council is only actually required during particularly pressing times. Normally, each Grand Master is responsible to send out his brothers to whatever he believes they can do the most good. And as mentioned just a little while ago, these deployments can be as small as a single squad of Battle Brothers. These squads are organised much like the other Astartes chapters, with one squad made up of ten Grey Knights, along with, of course, the de facto sergeant that is given the title of Justicar and given the job of focusing the psychic potential of all the other brothers in the squad. This role is usually given to the most potent and disciplined of the psychers in that group of Battle Brothers. The squad can also, along the usual Astartes lines, be divided into two squads of five, the so-called Combat Squad. And whilst even Space Marines would flinch at sending ten brothers to a war zone, remember, each and every one of these guys is the equivalent of a fully trained Astartes librarian. So ten Grey Knights is probably the equivalent of an entire company of Space Marines. Additionally, squads or larger formations may also be joined by a part of the Brotherhood's upper command echelon, such as, for example, the Brother Captain. He's the guy in actual direct tactical command of the Brotherhood and directly under the Grand Master. The Brotherhoods also have a champion and an ancient in addition to, of course, the Grand Master himself. As you can probably imagine as well, these kind of ultra-small-scale deployments require a tremendous degree of flexibility from each and every single squad within each and every single Brotherhood. This need for tactical flexibility is met by ensuring that every Grey Knight brother is trained in every role he might be called upon to carry out. This is one of the reasons why the Grey Knights have a centralised armoury under the First Brotherhood, where all of the Land Raiders, the Rhinos and the other vehicles are stored and then requisitioned by the other Brotherhoods as needed on their deployments. Their other equipment are also parceled out as needed. Every Grey Knight can serve as a member of the Terminator Squads, the Interceptors, the Purgation Squads, the Strike Squads, or as a crew member of one of their armoured vehicles. There is, however, one exception to this flexibility. Alongside the Eight Brotherhoods are two other... Orders? shall we say, miniature organisations within the Grey Knights which are highly specialised and do not take part in the usual organisation of the chapter and the flexibility of it. These are the Purifiers and the Paladins. We shan't dive into the specifics about them here because I suspect this video is going to be long enough already, but I'm sure we'll get back to them at some point. Suffice to say for right now, the Purifiers, as the name suggests, carry around enormous flamethrowers and are selected from amongst the most fanatical members of the Grey Knights. Let that sink in there for a moment. The most fanatical members of the incorruptibly pure Grey Knights. Yes, indeed, and the Grey Knight's Paladins are selected from those with the greatest level of martial prowess in the entire chapter. To even be considered to join their ranks, you need to complete eight ridiculous, next to impossible quests, each one worse than the other, and only after having done all of them will the brother be elevated to the rank of Paladin and become one of the chapter's venerated champions. 
But with all this talk about flexibility, weaponry, squads and flamethrowers, I think it's time we have a look at the Grey Knight Armoury. Because there are some very interesting deviations in there from standard Astartes equipment. Like, for example, that the basic ranged weapon for each and every Grey Knight is a Storm Bolter. Normally, the ridiculous bone-breaking kick of a Storm Bolter would leave it the sole purview of Terminator squads, as only their heavy armor contains the dampeners necessary to control the weapon on full auto. And yet, it is the standard weaponry for the Grey Knights. In part, this is due to their superior training and the fact that, to them, Terminators is their baseline infantry. Which is certainly saying something. But even more so, it also has to do with the superior quality of their armor. At first glance, the power armor worn by the Grey Knights may appear to be similar to that used by the other Astartes chapters. But in reality, it is far more finely wrought and fitted to each and every individual Grey Knight. The protection it offers would be the equal of Artificer armor in any other chapter, reserved only for the highest ranking officers and champions. Furthermore, the Grey Knight's Aegis armor also comes with the wrist-mounted Storm Bolter and a complex series of psychic defenses woven into the plating itself. Beyond the simple quality and the expertise of its manufacture, this is what makes Aegis armor so very, very special. And the secret to the manufacturing and integration of this defensive network is known only to a tiny handful of master craftsmen even within the Grey Knights. It is a series of wards, of runes, of insignias, and prayers that feed upon the psychic energy of the Grey Knight wearing the armor to power itself up and create a near-complete shield of protection against all psychic attacks and effects directed towards the wearer. This not only allows the Grey Knights to wade through seas of immaterial fire without so much as scorching the paintwork on their battle plates, but it also helps to confound the senses of the demons. The monsters of the warp do not perceive the material world like you and I do. Instead, they see, hear, and smell through their own immaterial senses, which in turn do their best to create a simulacrum of our way of viewing the world. A demon can see, hear, and smell, but in a very different way than we do. And with the Grey Knights covered in warding runes, their senses simply slide off them. Even when face to face with a Grey Knight, the demon is likely to see nothing more than a blurred shape, a golden outline. And whilst demons are often able to sense the presence of mortals from extreme distances, the Grey Knights are also completely hidden from the demon's view. Which is another reason why the Grey Knights are so effective. One of the demon's greatest strengths is their ability to perceive reality in this completely different way, including the ability to tug on the strands of fate and orchestrate events decades, centuries, and even millennia ahead of time in the case of some of Zinch's more ambitious servants. But the Grey Knights are as ghosts in this web, and even the most well-laid plans of the most devious Lord of Change cannot perceive the Grey Knight's actions. And of course, there's uh, also the function of the armor as, well, armor. <laughs> As mentioned, the Aegis armor would be at least on the same level of efficiency as Space Marine Artificer armor, and most mundane weapons would simply ricochet harmlessly off its perfectly crafted and thickly plated angles. 
The suit also grants superior maneuverability and agility compared to regular power armor, and this even extends to Terminator plate as well, as the Terminators deployed by the Grey Knights are capable of far more delicate maneuvers than their lumbering brethren in other chapters. But of course, a shield is only as good as the sword it protects, and the Grey Knights have a wide variety of weaponry, both to deal with more conventional enemies, you'd be surprised how many times filthy dirty Xenos get in the way of the smiting of demons, not to mention of course the Warp Fiend's habit of hiding behind human cultists and other heretical rabble. They can draw upon the full extent of the regular Space Marine armory. Bolt weapons, assault cannons, LAS cannons, missile launchers, etc. In addition to their own far more heavily specialized weaponry, some of which is simple variants on already existing Space Marine weaponry, like for example the Psy Cannon. It is in essence a heavy bolter, but just like the Grey Knight's Aegis armor, it is a more advanced version of the weapon used by the regular Space Marine chapters, and what makes it truly unique is its ammunition. Each and every single one of the high explosive bolts are carefully and meticulously manufactured by hand one by one. This exacting standard of manufacturing is made absolutely necessary by the lethal payload contained within each bolt round. Not just the high explosive, but a negative psychic charge, which must be bound within the round by tightly scrawled ritualistic prayers and scripture carved directly into the metal of the bolt, which is finally then tipped with pure silver. This obviously makes for a nasty anti-demon weapon, and it also comes with one added bonus as well. The psychic charge worked into the rounds is also able to defeat most known shield technology, since stuff like a void shield for example works by shifting parts of a projectile's energy into the warp. Essentially, it enacts a psychic effect upon the incoming weaponry. If the weapon itself is shielded by negative psychic energy, however, there's nothing the Void Shield can do, and so it is no more protection than a soap bubble against Psy Cannon rounds. And of course, the idea of making psychically active weaponry is a running theme throughout the Grey Knights, including also their close quarter combat weaponry, so called Nemesis Force Weapons. Now, Force Weapons are something that already exists in some quantity throughout the Imperium, usually used by Astartes Psychers, librarians. These are similar to those weapons in that they are made specifically to focus the psychic energy of the wielder, though the Nemesis Force Weapons of the Grey Knights are even more finely wrought than those used by the librarians of other chapters. Nevertheless, the basic idea remains the same, and the potency of each individual weapon is dependent upon the psychic might of the wielder. And seeing as each and every Grey Knight has the psychic power equal to that of the highest members of other chapters librarius, it's quite the thing to behold. This specialization has also led to a wide variety of Nemesis Force weapons. Initially, the basic Grey Knight brother will be given a Nemesis Force halberd. Back in the day, these were quite clearly styled on the weapons used by the Custodes. They even incorporated a bolter just like the Custodes Guardian Spears do. This has since been replaced in favor of the wrist mounted Storm Bolter, however. To return to the idea of variety, though, there are hammers, fists, falchions, swords, greatswords, staves, you name it. 
since the potency of such a force weapon is dependent upon the wielder's psychic might, and his psychic power in turn is determined by his strength of mind, it makes a great deal of sense to grant a warrior the weapon that he is most comfortable with wielding. And of course, like all other Grey Knight weaponry, each and every force weapon is custom made for the brother wielding it. But guns, swords, halberds, this is all very well and good, but sometimes you need something with a bit more... radius. Yeah. In those cases, of course, they have access to the usual grenades, frag and crack, but they also have access to an extremely rare and hyper-specialized grenade, the Psych-Out Grenade. This weapon is manufactured from the golden dust that falls off the God Emperor's throne. <laughs> That should give you some idea as to how rare and unfathomably precious these things are. Pretty much the only forces in the galaxy capable of using them on a semi-reliable basis are the Grey Knights and the highest levels of the Inquisition. But their effect is worth it. The detonation of a psych-out grenade will spread the dust in a large area, and it in turn will create a similar effect to that of an extremely powerful psychic blank. In the case of a demon, it will simply just pff, shunt the bastard right out of reality, no questions asked. Even greater demons might be banished by a single one of these weapons. As for other non-demonic psychers, it will leave them blinded, stunned, and unable to even use a tiny fraction of their psychic powers for an extended period. And that's the best case scenario. Presuming they aren't either instantaneously driven mad, or knocked unconscious, or straight up killed by the effect. But of course, there is yet another weapon, and shield, that the Grey Knights possess that far outweigh the value, the use, and the potency of every other arm or armor in their arsenal, even their psychic powers, and that is, of course, knowledge. God Emperor, in his prime, thought to banish the Chaos Gods entirely from the galaxy. He sought complete victory and the absolute defeat of the vile arch enemy. The only way to achieve this was to create a godless galaxy, one in which religion and superstition did not exist. Or where it did, it was as a joke, something to be laughed at and ridiculed. Because the gods can draw power from almost anything, so long as there is the idea of attributing any action to a supernatural entity, no matter how vague or non-specific it may be, it can and will feed the Chaos Gods even more so when it comes to ritual or religion. This is the reason why the gods call themselves the gods, why their demons refer to themselves as demons, why they can be summoned via elaborate rituals, why they encourage worship and cults. It is because this is the thing that grants them the most power. Unfortunately for the Emperor, he was far too kind and doting a father, and wanted to spare his sons from the horrors of the secrets that he had to carry. He thought they would be strong enough to resist temptation, but as is so often the case, the Primarchs, in their ignorance, thought they knew better. And at this point, the cat is well and truly out of the bag. There is no final victory to be won against the gods, at the very least not in any foreseeable timeline. 
And so the best that humanity can do is fight against the forces of chaos by utilizing their rules against them. This is one of the traps that many a radical inquisitor falls for. Utilizing chaos against chaos is absolutely an effective and worthwhile weapon, because the demons are bound by ironclad rules imposed upon them by us. But chaos also inevitably corrupts, and only the most strong-willed, the most engineered for the tasks, and those constantly trained in the rigors of maintaining their purity can have any hope of wielding the weapons of chaos against chaos for any extent of time. But of course, the Grey Knights are just one such force, and so their primary weapon, their best weapon, is not a bolter. It is not a special bolt round, and it is not a sword, it is the Liber Diamonicum. This is no ordinary book either. This is, in essence, a chaos artifact, but devoted to another chaos god entirely, one who's been sitting down for a few thousand years at this point. It is prop full of ritualistic significance, of prayers, of inscriptions, of wards, and of runes. Each and every single spine of each and every single book has a carved thigh-bone of an imperial saint worked into it. It is steeped in religious significance, and each and every copy carried into battle by the Grey Knights in a ceramite armoured cage on their breastplate contains precisely 666 words. Never any less, never any more. This alone makes it an incredibly potent weapon that can banish demons practically by itself, its mere presence, and the words read out aloud by the Grey Knights from its pages. There are also some more voluminous versions that contains all of the Grey Knights' knowledge, including lengthy lists of every single known demon's true name their identifications, how to find them, how to defeat them, the specific rituals meant to banish them. It also contains treaties on morals and philosophy, when an exterminatus mission is necessary, when allies should be executed for the greater good, when chaos should be pursued, when there are better targets, etc, etc, etc. Everything a Grey Knight ever needs to know. There is an even more powerful version as well, referred to as the Domina Liber Diamonica. This contains not just prayers and scriptures, but rather 666 words of banishment. Each and every one incredibly powerful in their own rights, but together they might even be able to kill a Chaos God. No one has tried that yet, but might be a worthwhile experiment. If only somebody could FedEx it to that uh, Drago guy, that'd be interesting. <laughs> but now that we've talked about their history, a bit about their organization and war gear, it's time to talk about the Grey Knights in actual combat. And considering I did a whole lore video on the war for Armageddon, that is the only real option now, isn't it? Now, part of me would like to suggest that you go watch the War for Armageddon series, yet another part of me remembers what an absolute rank fucking amateur I was back then as well. <laughs> oh well. The Inquisition will tell you that there have only ever been two invasions of the industrial world of Armageddon both of which were perpetrated by the greenskin warlord Gazgul Mag-Uruk-Thraka. 
And on both occasions, the loyal servants of the Imperium and the Armageddon Steel Legion along with Adeptus Astartes reinforcements drove the vile green-skinned monsters off the holy soil of Armageddon, reclaiming it in the name of the God Emperor. But there was a first war for Armageddon, one that did not involve even a single orc and one that whilst it technically ended in an imperial victory, saw the complete removal of the entirety of Armageddon's population to be replaced by colonists drawn from across the Imperium. It was these colonists that defeated Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka. The first war for Armageddon was also within a whisker of turning the Space Wolves chapter into renegade Space Marines, at least in the eyes of the powers that be. But it all began deep within the warp, when a massive Space Hulk named the Devourer of Stars appeared in high orbit above a demon world, which just happened to be the new homeworld of Angron the demon Primarch. The Red Angel, or as I like to call him, Daddy E's greatest disappointment, had been trying to reforge the shattered remnants of his World Eaters Legion for the last 10,000 years. But unfortunately for Angron, he was possessed of all the unbridled charisma of a dead codfish after having been run over by a 16-wheeler truck thrice, and so had by and large failed miserably in the effort. The appearance of the Devourer of Stars, however, finally gave him an opportunity to gather up at least some elements of his fractured legion, since this was a ticket out of the warp and into real space where the cornered berserkers could run properly wild, butchering the weak faithful of the corpse emperor. And as if guided by destiny and the hands of the gods themselves, once the Devourer was full of chaos faithful, heretics, cultists, and a significant number of World Eaters berserkers as well, it popped out of existence in the warp and tore its way into reality in the Armageddon system where the groundwork had already been laid long, long ago. <laughs> For someone who didn't want to be a slave, he sure is quite the puppet, isn't he? Anywho, enough shitting on Angron, at least for the immediate time being. Armageddon had already been infested by large-scale chaos cults hidden away in the massive hive cities dotting the planet. Armageddon was a major centre for industry, and it had a large PDF presence along with stationed Imperial Guard regiments and orbital defences. But they were all intent on defeating an internal revolt, or discouraging pirates or small-scale external threats. They were not in any way prepared with a huge warp storm breaking across the system and isolating it from the rest of the Imperium, followed up by the invasion of a space hulk stuffed full of chaos space marines. The orbital defences, those few that remained in the hands of the planetary defence force and stationed Imperial Guard regiments, were helpless to prevent the Devourer of Stars gaining stable orbit above Armageddon and unloading its devastating payload of blood-maddened monsters down onto the surface. Millions of Chaos cultists and hundreds, possibly thousands, of Chaos Space Marines were all disgorged from the Devourer of Stars. But the greatest impact upon the Defenders came in the arrival of Angron himself, a fully-fledged demon Primarch with his personal bodyguard of the Cruor Praetoria. Twelve of the mightiest demon princes in Korn's service. 
The impact of such creatures upon the material world cannot be overstated. And the previous waves of madness and terror that had swept the planet and caused massive cultist uprisings were now redoubled in effort. Nearly half of all Imperial Guard regiments and planetary defense forces on Armageddon were immediately driven insane or were given the cue to act on their long-standing allegiances as they turned in unison away from the light of the Emperor. Their betrayed comrades were beset upon from every direction and forced out of the entirety of the continent of Armageddon Prime. The ragged, bloodied and beaten defenders were forced to retreat through the near impassable equatorial jungles, losing further thousands in the process. When the scattered, desperate and terrorized survivors finally arrived on the other side, they found a massively entrenched defense line waiting for them, manned by the remaining PDF and Imperial Guard regiments on Armageddon Secundus. In a display of incredible bravery and devotion, the majority of these survivors hefted their las guns and joined the defenders on the defensive line along the rivers of Styx and Charon, where they then had to wait for the demons to come storming out of the greenery. It was, however, to be the very foul, unholy nature of the opposition that would come to the rescue of the brave defenders of Armageddon. Angron and his demonic hordes were now no longer creatures of the purely material world, particularly his bloodthirsters' bodyguards. They needed Armageddon to be turned into a hell world, a realm of the warp, otherwise they could not continue their own existence. Already, the warp storm that shrouded the system was beginning to weaken, and their grip on the reality was fading. Angron built vast monuments of skulls and flesh and bone and marrow deep within the equatorial jungle where his forces made planetfall. This reprieve granted the defenders the time they needed to get organized to dig in and thank the God Emperor receive reinforcements in the form of the Space Wolves Great Company under the command of Logan Grimnar himself, their chapter master. And so, when the monsters finally did emerge from the equatorial jungle, they met an organized gun line of Imperial Guard, planetary defenses, and space wolves. But even the might of the Vlaka Fenrika could not stop Angron. Or at least so it appeared. As Angron and his bloodthirster bodyguard smashed through the Imperial line. It seemed as if the demonic hordes would now begin flooding through and heading straight towards the civilian hive cities nearby. But this too had been a plan laid down by Logan Grimnar, who as a chapter master had knowledge of the Grey Knights, as he had seen them fighting before, and the usual mind wiping or straight up executions used to keep witnesses quiet had not been applied to the Great Wolf. As Angron, ever heedless of anything else around him in battle, stormed forward, he became isolated from the majority of the demonic hordes, and nearly the entirety of the Third Grey Knight's Brotherhood, under the command of Brother Captain Taremar Aurelian, teleported down directly on top of the Demon Primarch. Over a hundred Grey Knight Terminators opened up with every weapon at point-blank range. Many of the twelve greater demons surrounding Angron disappeared in a blizzard of anti-demonic firepower. But the demon Primarch himself would not be put down so easily. Like a breaking storm, he crashed into the Grey Knights, sending Terminator-armed silvered warriors flying through the air, bisected and armor rent open like tissue paper. 
Nearby, the Space Wolves were witnesses to the titanic conflict as they fought to keep the rest of the demons at bay. As they immediately saw the threat to the demon Primarch, the horde surged once again. But the wolves held firm, buying the Grey Knights more time to battle against the demon leadership. It was a Grey Knight pirate kid by the name of Hyperion that finally turned the tide. Standing over a wounded battle brother, Hyperion focused every ounce of his soul's power, fury, and fate into an attack that overloaded the Cornet Primarch's weapon, the Black Blade, a demon entity in its own right which shattered into a million pieces under Hyperion's mental assault. The enormous strain placed upon him would send him into a coma and leave him combat inoperable for four months, a ridiculous amount of time for the rapid healing of an Adeptus Astartes. But the disarmed Cornet Primarch was now stunned and vulnerable, and finally, the brother Captain Aurelian was able to banish the creature though it cost him his own life to do so. With the demon Primarch slain, his body destroyed, and his spirit sent screaming back into the warp, but it would take decades, if not centuries, to reform again. The demonic hordes screamed as one, broke, fled, and were slaughtered by the vengeful space wolves, who seized the moment to drive a merciless retort into the heart of the demonic hordes. The demon's human allies, the Chaos Space Marines and cultists, would be viciously hunted for miles and miles until being completely annihilated. Though the Imperium was victorious, however, the stain left upon the world of Armageddon was not so easy to destroy as the mortal followers of the gods. The equatorial jungle would grow even more hostile thereafter. The location of Angron's temple would be bombarded from orbit and then left in a quarantined area never to be visited again. Or at least that was the plan. Further areas of the planet were also rendered inhospitable by the demonic taint and the corruption. Fortunately for the planet, it was not deemed to have been completely bent, broken, or corrupted by the forces unleashed upon it. It was also simply too vital a resource for the Imperium, but the population had been exposed. The Hive cities had been ravaged by cultists. Blood had flown freely in the streets in the middle of a demonic invasion. The entire native populace, including the Imperial Guard soldiers and the PDF troops that had fought so valiantly to defend the world, would be captured, rounded up, placed aboard bulk carriers, and sent to work camps across the Imperium to live out their days in toil and eventually die. Those who were thought to be too far gone would simply be executed by the Inquisition as they carried out the mass exodus. This was seen as a most hideous betrayal by the Space Wolves, and for damn good reason, who began trying to evacuate the loyal Imperial servants, which brought them into direct conflict with the Inquisition and the Grey Knights with the two sides engaging each other in open battle across Armageddon and in near space, as the Space Wolves tried to avoid the forces of the Inquisition and rescue some of the survivors. Now, of course, the Grey Knights know better than anyone the potential cost of leaving those who have been corrupted by chaos alone. Even the most loyal or well-meaning Imperial citizen can be turned into a gateway for chaos infestation and eventual invasion. But this was something else entirely. The destruction of an entire world's population and open warfare against the Space Wolves. 
The Grey Knights would come to refer to this five-month campaign as the Months of Shame. But the Inquisition was adamant, and its leader in the sector, Grandmaster Yoros, would insist that the campaign continue. However, as it ground on and on for months and months, the effects were limited and the costs and the dangers were rising rapidly. The dissent was rising as well. Even fellow inquisitors were beginning to question the Grand Master's means and his motives. The Grey Knights were on the verge of rebelling. And so the Inquisition did what the Inquisition does best, escalate as Grandmaster Joros came up with a plan to invade the Fenris system, lay siege to Fenris herself, and directly threaten the Space Wolves' fortress monastery of the Fang. That almost reaches the level of Eldar diplomacy. Upon reaching Fenris, the Grandmaster sent down an ultimatum to the Space Wolves, who had only a small garrison force left on the fan. The Grand Master himself of the Inquisition would go down to treat with Bjorn Fellhand, the dreadnought that had been around since the time of the Horus Heresy, who had been reawoken specifically for the purpose of treating with the Inquisition. They had also brought along with them not just the Grey Knights, but also the Red Hunters Space Marines, a chapter well known for its loyalty to the Inquisition and its willingness to do absolutely anything that they required of them. The Red Hunters were also necessary as muscle, as the Grey Knights. They had received the orders to join the Grand Master, but they were taking their sweet time in getting there, and only small numbers of the Grey Knights had arrived. Again, he was getting dangerously close to the point where he might be betrayed by the Knights themselves. The Inquisition's demands, however, did not take into account their weakening position in the slightest. As the Inquisition demand that the Space Wolves hand over all the remaining people of Armageddon, that the Space Wolves all undergo brain wipes, that they also go on a penitent crusade as well to prove that they were sorry for their actions. Inquisitor would not receive his demands, as the entirety of the Space Wolves chapter emerged in system and began their assault upon the Inquisitorial Armada. A fierce space battle erupted as Logan Grimnar boarded the Inquisitor's vessel. The Inquisitor's ships and the Red Hunters fighting a vicious two-front war against the incoming fleet and the orbital defenses of the Fang were engaged in a bloody struggle for simple survival, which ended when Logan Grimnar beheaded the Lord Inquisitor. Logan was set to continue the slaughter of the entire Inquisitorial task force, including the Grey Knights and the Astartes, but Bjorn Fellhand teleporting onto the bridge as well made Logan see sense, and instead a compromise was reached. No further actions would be taken against the Space Wolves. The fighting would end immediately, and the Inquisition would withdraw, never again to return to Fenris. In return, the Space Wolves would surrender the last of the survivors of Armageddon, but they would not submit to brain wipes. This was agreed upon by the remaining representatives of the Inquisition, and ever since, the Space Wolves have not been fans of either the Inquisition or the Grey Knights. Small surprise, not just due to the dishonourable nature of the Inquisition's actions, but due to the damage inflicted on both sides, but perhaps most severely on the Space Wolves. 
The fang had suffered extensive damage, beyond even that inflicted during the 32nd millennium when it was attacked by Magnus the Red. The thought that loyalists inflicted a worse wound on the Space Wolves than a demon Primarch, or a shard of him at least, is um, a wonderful example of Imperial bureaucracy, is it not? But there you have it, the Grey Knights. Their history, their organizations, their weapons, and uh, one of their proudest and also lowest moments. Because, remember, the Grey Knights fight against chaos in all its forms. The most glorious of such combat includes the killing of demons, of monsters, of blatantly evil foes. But chaos is pernicious, and chaos corrupts, and many times the Grey Knights have to kill things that do not look particularly monstrous at all. And yet the sword must still be swung, because that is the Grey Knight's oath and their duty. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.